Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome back to New Books in History, a channel of the New Books Network. I am Vladislav Lilic, a doctoral candidate in modern European history at Vanderbilt University. In today's episode, I have the honor to welcome Dr. Linda Coley, the Shelby M. C. Davis 1958 Professor of History at Princeton University. All of you will know Professor Coley as a luminary in the fields of British and Imperial history and the author of many a path-breaking work, including Britons, Forging the Nation, and my personal favorite, The Splendid Captives, Britain, Empire, and the World. In the next 45 or so minutes, we will discuss her captivating new book, The Gun, the Ship, and the Pen, Warfare, Constitutions, and the Making of the Modern World published by Liverite earlier this year. Bold, imaginative, and strikingly original, the monograph narrates a sweeping global history of written constitutions from the mid-18th to the 21st century, challenging established accounts and uncovering the close connections between constitution-making and warfare. Professor Coley brings to the fore historiographically neglected sites and actors focusing on the myriad ways in which constitutions cross boundaries and intersected with wider political, cultural, and socioeconomic forces in all corners of the globe, by displaying both the liberating and the repressive effects of modern constitutions, the gun, the ship, and the pen retells the serpentine story of successful and failed attempts to redefine the functions and limits of state governments. Professor Coley, thank you for joining New Books in History and for taking the time to talk to me about your work. Pleasure. As is customary on our channel, I will start us off by asking how your previous intellectual and research trajectories had led you to write this book. Well, the span of my historical inquiry has got wider geographically as I have advanced in my career, I suppose. And I think that's natural. One accumulates more information, but one also accumulates uh, perhaps more confidence, uh, more range of theoretical backgrounds. And I started out as a British political historian, then moved on histories of nationalism. Then I became fascinated by the British Empire. And moving on from the British Empire to an interest in global history is, of course, not too difficult in some ways. Uh, One has to be careful not to look at things just through or even mainly through the view of the British and their empire. But since the British Empire did move greedily into so many continents, uh, moving on from that to a more global inquiry seemed uh, in some ways both natural and inexorable. Let us start with the gun and the ship from the title. Uh, You argue that the proliferation of single document written constitutions around the mid-18th century was not only spurred by the pressures of mass politics and the Enlightenment intellectual currents. Rather, you highlight the central role played by repeated bouts of large-scale armed violence across the globe in what you'd term hybrid warfare. Uh, Would you perhaps care to elaborate on the book's core thesis? Yes, I don't think it's a case of either or, Mm -hmm. but I do think if one wants to look at new written constitutions across continents and countries, then different levels of warfare and violence are the most recurrent influence. Why Is this so? And why does this become particularly pronounced from the 18th century? Because, of course, there have have always been wars. Well, partly because we know that big-scale wars, really big-scale wars, transcontinental wars, 
are becoming a more regular occurrence after 1700. And and that has been uh, established by all sorts of uh, diagrams and calculations. But it's not just that these kind of wars are becoming more regular, but precisely because they are transcontinental wars, they are increasingly expensive, not just in men, but in treasure. Because, of course, if you're going to run a transcontinental war, uh, you need navies. And while if you're wanting to pack men into an army, you can always empty the jails or bring in the poor and so forth, uh, navies are just relentlessly expensive uh, and they're becoming increasingly expensive from the 17th century. And by the middle of the 18th century, any great power that wants to indulge in transcontinental warfare is having to uh, invest in these hundreds of large ships that don't just need a lot of raw materials. Uh, They need naval stations to support them, shipbuilding yards, skilled people, uh, huge amounts of victuals, and so on and so on. How does that feed into constitutions in multiple ways? Um, First of all, those states that build up these kind of navies have to increase their tax levels as well as their levels of raising manpower. And one way of legitimizing these greater military and naval expenses is to experiment with new kinds of contracts with your public or more particularly your male public saying, here are certain guarantees of rights uh, in return for higher levels of taxation, a willingness to serve, and increasingly the emphasis is on conscription. Uh, And you see that more and more in constitutions. Um, And that's not just in the West. After 1850, growing numbers of constitutions outside the West, too, are saying uh, more votes, perhaps a parliament, but in return, an obligation to serve for the male population. Uh, That, for example, is what Japan does in its uh, remarkable 1889 constitution. So that's one way that, that that in order to raise men and money for these mammoth wars, you start using constitutions as a kind of contract. But also, of course, uh, the sheer demands of these mammoth wars provokes or can provoke opposition. Um, and you know, if you look at the onset of the American Revolutionary War, which is obviously going to be productive of new constitutions, mm-hmm. or the French Revolutionary War, ditto. Uh, in each case, these huge revolutionary explosions can partly, well, quite substantially, be attributed to rising tax demands. Uh, by Britain in the first case, France in the second, uh, to pay for these uh, hybrid wars, as I call them, wars demanding big navies as well as big armies. Yes, and from early on, you stress that written constitutions performed a plethora of, of different historical functions. We usually associate these documents with the rise of let's say, Republican democratic ideals, anti-imperial revolutions, and the concepts of self-rule and or self-determination. However, you convincingly show that late 18th century constitutions, in fact, sought to reform, stabilize, or even expand the power of monarchs and monarchies and growing state bureaucracies. How would you characterize this earliest stage of modern constitution making? 
Well, I think monarchs play a, a considerable role in constitution making before the First World War. Generally, uh, you know, they have to because outside the Americas, most countries mm -hmm. uh, across the globe in 1914 still have monarchs or an equivalent figure. Um, and one, one sees monarchs experimenting with these kind of contractual texts quite early. Um, uh, the King of Sweden in 1772 issues uh, what he calls a form of government. Hmm. Um, uh, again, uh, Sweden, be a very warlike country in those days, um, had been experimenting with these kind of contracts quite early. But here's a new one in Sweden, the, the form of government. And it makes no bones of the fact that this is a fundamental law and the text, which is widely circulated in different languages, makes it clear that you know the, the king and not just the male populace is to swear allegiance to this form of government uh, because it confines, at least in theory, um, both monarch and subjects. Mm -hmm. And what is the role of the global increase of literacy and literary cultures in, in your narrative? Well, enormous, because, you know, that there have always been, or, well, always uh, types of uh, law code, uh, rules of government go back to classical times uh, and in other cultures even earlier. Um, Mesopotamia has a, a law code very, very early. But these are pretty much one-off texts. Uh, often they're inscribed on stones or they're put down in papyrus. Uh, there is, after all, no printing industry, and most people, anyway, can't read. So uh, ha the kind of modern constitution, written constitution that we take for granted now, has to wait for changes in literacy levels, because governments have to uh, except that it's somehow worthwhile to circulate these documents. Uh, and printing presses help enormously because, of course, with a printing press, you can mass produce these documents. And even more, perhaps, you can send copies of these documents beyond your own boundaries. Uh, and that is very important. We, we tend to think of constitutions uh, as having primarily a domestic function. Mm -hmm. But in fact, they've always had a much broader use than that. They serve a kind of manifesto function. Here is this state. This is what we do. This is what our boundaries are. Uh, we are changing the rules. Uh, these are these impressive new provisions that we are installing. The new United States after 1787 uh, is particularly assertive in doing this, partly because it's got a, a, a big newspaper press set up already, but also because the founding fathers understand what press can do, the press can do and print can do, not just at home, but also overseas to uh, establish their new republic among the powers of the world. And, and this becomes another big incentive for creating these kind of documents. It's a way of signaling that you're part of of the world and increasingly that you are a modern state. Um, and, and you can see that tendency growing as the 19th century develops. Uh, states thinking, well, if we want to establish ourselves as a place of modernity, 
then we need this kind of text. Mm-hmm. What is the role of movement and itinerant in- individuals, uh, such as Tom Paine, for example, in in the dispersal of, of these uh, written forms across the globe? Well, I think it mobility of people and not just mobility of print is very important because when you look at constitutions, they are not just, and, and they never have been and they still aren't, purely indigenous national products. Yeah. They are m- based much more on a principle of what I call pick and mix, um, with the writers taking ideas from different countries. uh, And sometimes they've learnt these ideas from different countries because the constitutions of other countries have been circulated in print. But very often, too, um, people are moving about, uh, particularly as uh, transport improves, and they're getting ideas uh, from exposure to different kinds of documents. And, uh, I mean, Tom Paine, when he joins the American Revolution um, and is deeply in favour of it, nonetheless, um, he retains the influence of his English upbringing um, and he's very interested in England in charters um, and what charters, even medieval charters, can do as uh, basing rights and, and setting them down on parchment and paper. And in a sense, what Payne does when he goes to what's going to be the United States and writes uh, his epic pamphlet and polemic, Common Sense, uh, in 1776. He's taking these ideas about charters, Magna Carta that he's got from England, which is where he's grown up, and applying it to a different situation uh, across the Atlantic and and adapting uh, his background to serve new purposes. And you get lots of other itinerants doing that. Uh, this is this is something that um, and, a, and another wonderful example I have is of a Scottish naval captain in 1838 uh, who has been exposed to new constitutions from various places. And when he lands in Pitcairn Island in the South Pacific in 1838, uh, the the mixed race population there, which is tiny, only about 100 people, Mm -hmm. but for various reasons, um, want some kind of document to protect them. Uh, against being invaded by others. And so he he drafts what becomes the first Pitcairn constitution, drawing on his own various ideas, uh, on ideas from other parts of the Pacific as well. And this Pitcairn constitution is a reminder that important texts can come even from very tiny places, because this is the first constitution in world history uh, to grant women the vote on the same basis as men. Uh, And the first constitution that says this, that sticks, because this constitution endures with some modification until the 1930s. Before we move on to small places, um, Moving into the 19th century, a number of wonderful case studies underlines both the emancipatory and the repressive aspects of modern constitutions, whereas some such supreme laws aim to disenfranchise and divide humanity along color, gender, ethnic lines, other constitutions served as tools of emancipation and resistance against colonial encroachment, for example. Could you perhaps offer a few examples of these divergent dynamics in the 19th century? 
Yes. Um, again, one could look at the Pacific and at Hawaii, mm-hmm. um, which starts adopting written constitutions from 1840. And there's a whole string of them Mm -hmm. uh, until Hawaii is finally absorbed into the United States in the 1890s. But initially, or at least for 50 years, Hawaii manages to keep uh, would-be American colonizers or competing European colonizers at bay partly by initiating this sequence of constitutions and, again, getting them translated, um, sending them to uh, capitals of the great powers and basically saying, look, um, again, we are a modern state. Uh, We have rules of law. Uh, We have a constitutional monarchy. We have an electorate, um, and the constitutions become more and more elaborate. And while, of course, in the end, the United States sweeps Hawaii up, uh, I think this would have happened perhaps sooner without these very conscious paper manifestos and one one sees less successful ones than that, but one also sees more successful ones too. Uh, one of the reasons why Japan, after it has a civil war in the 1860s, is determined to create its own constitution is partly, again, to flaunt the fact that it's now becoming a modern polity, albeit one uh, still ruled by a celestial emperor, but also because uh, increasingly before its civil war, it's it's having to repel uh, warships from the United States, mm-hmm. from Russia, from Prussia. And it's just increasingly worried about its survival as an independent polity uh, and fears that the West may start nibbling at it just as the Western powers are nibbling at China. So, And this constitution not only does flaunt modernity and keep the West at bay, but it also acts as a um, cheering signal, if you like, to anti-colonial radicals uh, wanting an example of a non-Western state able to play this game uh, and able to keep the game going, if you like. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And. What about what about disenfranchis- disenfranchisement and and division uh, along constitutional lines? Oh yes, well, um, lots of examples of that. Um, I think perhaps the the two huge expanses of territory that I look at most in this regard um, are both settler empires, if you like. Mm-hmm. One settler empire, the United States, uh, with a high level of white male democracy progressively after 1787. But of course, um, its settler population moving relentlessly westwards, moving into land previously held by indigenous peoples or by Mexico or even by Canada, claiming it for the United States, but not wanting, in many cases, most cases, to enfranchise indigenous people. And how do you do that? Well, one of the things you do is you allow state constitutions to proliferate. And these state constitutions, uh, again, do various things. 
they set up boundaries and they say um, California stretches from point A to B to C or whatever, ignoring, of course, that many of these territories are claimed by other peoples. But once you've got it in the state constitution, it seems legitimate. It seems, well, you know, it's written down, legal. It must be true. Um, And you, by not allowing Native Americans to vote, uh, you say, okay, look, you don't have to pay taxes, but um, you're not part of the political nation. Well, of course, if Native Americans can't vote, if they can't uh, stand for election, they have few means of opposing Mm. these takeovers of their land. And I have to say very similar uh, techniques are employed at different times by that other settler empire, Australia, Mm. which obviously has strong uh, links across the Pacific with the western coast of the United States. Mm -hmm. And how do we explain the absence of constitution making in some corners of the globe, 19th century, uh, Qing China comes to mind, but also the United Kingdom? Well, I think rather different explanations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As far as Qing China is concerned, um, yes, its borders, its maritime borders are being nibbled at by the Western powers, not least by Britain. But the Qing Empire is so vast and its armed forces on land are so huge that it mainly worries about its enemies in Central Asia. And because the Qing bureaucracy and the Qing emperors feel that, okay, yes, we've got problems, maritime problems, but uh, Central Asia is under control, this landmass we have. Um, I don't think there's such pressure on them. I mean, they don't build up a big navy until the end of the 19th century, so they don't need to raise taxes for that. And they're not engaging in huge overseas imperial campaigns. They've they've already got their armies, thank you very much. So there isn't the same need for creating new constitutions as a contract, if you like. And it's really only when the pressure to build up a navy increases at the end of the 19th century and China experiences defeat uh, and is particularly irked by losing to Japan, um, which it had regarded as an inferior Asian power, that you get Chinese intellectuals, Chinese bureaucrats beginning to think rather more about a new constitution. And there are some moderate attempts in the first decade of the 20th century uh, to set up committees to draft a Chinese constitution, but it's very slow and very reluctant, which is one reason why you get the Chinese revolution in 1911. So that's the China case. The British case is rather different, though there are also some overlapping tendencies. Um, Yes, Britain has a huge navy that it needs to fund But it's able in the 19th century to get access to a captive army, if you like, which it doesn't have to fund with its own taxpayers. It it can use the Indian army 
organized by the East India Company and paid for by Indian taxpayers. So although Britain is an immensely warlike power, um, it doesn't have to pay for its wars by the 19th century to the degree that you might expect. But the other reason, I think, is a much more nuanced one. Um, Although written constitutions are an expanding genre, um, a relentlessly expanding genre from 1750 onwards, there are arguments and sentiments against it. Um, And some of these are quite strongly entrenched in Britain. Um, How and why might you object to a written constitution? Well, you could actually go back to classical polemics and indeed to biblical arguments, uh, which stress very often that the best law code is not written down. It is interior. It is within. So St. Paul in the New Testament says that the best law code is written in the heart. Uh, It is something that is felt. And some people believe that very strongly. More practically, they argue, particularly in Britain, look, we are a very fast-changing society. Uh, We are the most industrialized society on the globe. Uh, We have a hugely rising population. Uh, We don't need a static constitution. We need something much more flexible. Uh, We want a set of rules that we register and that we accept, but we want to be able to change our political system, how our state works on a regular basis to keep up with the tempo of change. Now, I'm not saying that that was always a valid argument, but those arguments were made. Wonderful. I'm I'm fascinated by your wonderful mobilization of a number of understudied global locales. Uh, Recently, global historians have endeavored to scrutinize spatially modest, overlooked settings to test our assumptions about monumental, world-transforming historical processes. How do you use such small places as the above-mentioned Pitcairn Islands or Tahiti, Tunisia, to retell the story of modern political institutions and their change? What can such history teach about global connections and, and ruptures? Well, I wanted very much to get away from the model that, you know, has often been based on the American constitution, the the spread of, 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 of these kind of constitutional texts was a, a sort of relentless process of diffusion from uh, an American point of departure. Mm-hmm. It's much more complicated and diverse uh, and multifaceted than that, and and that's what global history can coax out. And by looking at some of these smaller places, I could coax out different um, traditions and practices of constitution writing. Um, people in Hawaii, people in Tunisia know, of course, about Western constitutions. They've they've studied them. But they also have different imperatives. And in both cases, they're very determined to use these texts, not just to proclaim their modernity, but also to proclaim certain distinctive continuities. So the Tunisian constitution, the first 
Muslim constitution of a modern type uh, produced in 1861 um, uses language and provisions to make it clear that this is an Islamic constitution. Um, By the same token, uh, the Hawaiian constitutions, of which I've already spoken, um, uses a whole set of vocabulary which was originally used in the Hawaiian um, language for water rights, traditional water rights on these Pacific islands. And it it applies, the writers of the Hawaiian, first Hawaiian constitution, applies this Hawaiian language of water rights, uh, something that can cater to all the people. And it uses that vocabulary to describe its new political constitution, Um, sort of deliberately putting together uh, the old and the indigenous with the new and the political, if you like. Mm-hmm. Splendid. Um, last but not least, the 20th in our present century have witnessed a seemingly never-ending evolution in constitutional forms and further growth in the number of these documents. Yet, uh, one of the book's key takeaways is the historical fact that constitutions have not been innocent devices, as you put it. On the contrary, their effectiveness in securing rights and imposing constraints on governments has been limited. Uh, Why then are so many societies still willing to invest time and effort in these legal political vessels? In an uncertain, unequal, violent world, are constitutions the best we can hope for? Well, um, you know, much of human life is the triumph of hope over experience. Uh, And I suppose written constitutions are an example of this. But I think we can be more positive than that. Um, These are documents of hope. They are often documents of a new beginning. They still can fulfill their traditional purpose of being not just for domestic population, but to act as manifestos to the world at large, to signal to others what a polity, perhaps particularly a newly established polity, is about. And I think they can act as a work of reference But, of course, this depends on people paying attention to them. And also, I think people renewing and amending written constitutions on a regular basis, which is always a struggle. But Otherwise, those who criticized uh, written constitutions for being too static have a point that if a written constitution does not keep pace with changes in society, economics, political structures, challenges, and so forth, then um, it may be a cherished icon, but it may also lose political heft and interest to the population at large. Um, And, you know, as I say at the end, uh, and I I did this with some diffident because, uh, as my accent suggests, I'm I'm not American by birth. Um, But, you know, you could say that this is a real problem now with the U.S. federal constitution. Uh, It is not just very old, but the Founding Fathers made it difficult to amend quite deliberately because they were worried about the security of their new republic. Um, And there's, there's, you know, there's various problems. For example, um, the uh, Founding Fathers were deeply worried about 
aristocracies. And so they were very careful to make sure that to insert in their constitution bans on uh, Americans accepting titles. But they didn't put in any provisions in the constitution warning against plutocrats and um, the potential danger of huge fortunes. Um, because in those days, in 1787, there, there weren't plutocrats in the new United States. Well, there's plenty of plutocrats in the United States now, um, and we know they have an impact, a variety of impact, on the political system. There's nothing about this really in the existing federal constitution. So do you want to revise the constitution to pick up this point? Um, one should at least perhaps debate this point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Finally, uh, where has this project taken you? Professor Coley, what are you currently working on? What I'm doing at the moment, uh, unsurprisingly, is uh, recovering energy and reading books and uh, getting new ideas. Um, I This book took me 10 years to write, as well as absorbing insights and material that I'd accumulated before that. So I suppose I feel rather emptied out at the moment. Um, I have various projects circling in my mind, but I think until, um, you know, I want to catch up on reading new things, I, I may uh, write a more theoretical article uh, on the whole issue of global history and constitutions, uh, not having to do the kind of spade work which is now available in print in the book. So that's one possibility. But I have, I have other ideas, um, but at the moment they're still cloaked in a kind of residual fatigue. Mm-hmm. Well, many of us are excited to see what is the next thing to emerge out of your workshop. Um, Professor so, Coley. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, so will I be excited. <laughs> Let us see. Professor Coley, it was an immense pleasure talking to you today. Uh, thank you for joining New Books in History. It's been a privilege and a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>